Hello, this is Movie Night Movie Review. Vincent's pick tonight is The Grapes of Wrath. The reason I'm doing this review, this movie, is there's some uh, big misconceptions about the whole story and this part of American history, especially, that uh, I'd like to try and clear up. When I saw this movie as a boy, this story really affected me. It's a tragic story. The whole situation's tragic, and it could have been avoided, but I'd like to clear that up. One interesting uh, thing about this movie is it's actually based on a book by uh, John Steinbeck. And uh, John Steinbeck actually saw this movie when it came out. A lot of people don't know that. He sat down and watched it. And he actually liked that the movie had a more of a happy ending to it, as he, as he referred to it. It had a little more positive spin with some hope at the end of it. Where his book is uh, kind of starts out good, but it goes downhill the rest of the way. Where the movie kind of starts out bad, and it kind of gets good a little bit, and then it kind of leaves you with some hope. So uh, this is a perfect example of a book and uh, the movie not uh, being in sync with each other. I thought it was interesting. The basic uh, plot outline, though, of this uh, story is it follows the jo Jode family, uh, J-O-A-D, uh, who are from Oklahoma, and they are sharecroppers. And anyway, uh, the story uh, starts out with Tom Jode, played by Henry Fonda, the great Henry Fonda, who uh, is get just getting out of pr on parole. Apparently he was in jail for accidentally killing a guy. And uh, he comes walking back home one day and hitchhiking a little bit and uh, finds out that some circumstances have really changed back home. And that's where the story begins. Now Tom is uh, walking along and he comes to meet up with uh, who they call the uh, preacher, played by uh, John Carradine, the great John Carradine, who was a uh, terrific actor. Uh, God, he was in so many films and TV shows over the years. And just did a wonderful job in this movie. He's just so memorable. Um, and he's another tragic figure as well. As Tom and the preacher head back to the Jode family farm, uh, this begins the scariest and creepiest sequence of the movie. Um, it's it's probably my favorite sequence just because it's so creepy and scary. And just the reality of this is more frightening than anything else that uh, stuff like this even happened is, is really what's really frightening and uh, it's disturbing. As it turns out, the uh, Jode family farm it seems to be abandoned. Nobody's there. They're not sure if the family's even alive. And the only person around seems to be this guy named Muley, who's just hanging around out in the fields, sleeping around like a bum, basically, in the area. And he comes to tell Tom and the preacher his story of what happened. And this is uh, a tragic uh, chapter in uh, history. Now, uh, here's what happened. Uh, Muley s says that one day he's uh, farming and some very well-to-do person rolls up and tells him that, you know, he's got his notice that he has to get off his land. He has to get out of there. And that's what happened to all the families in the area. They were all told they had to leave. And Muley, being an ignorant farmer, uh, I don't mean that in a bad way, it's just a fact, didn't understand this whole situation and that's really what the tragedy is of this movie and I don't know I think the movie shows you that and I think you can assume that but uh, it doesn't make this clear this point uh, exactly what's going on and why it's happening in any event Muley's under the impression that he owns this property that he's lived there generations have lived there and died there and there's a pivotal scene here where he grabs the soil and he says that's what makes it his. So in his mind, this is his property. And this is the part of the movie I wish would have been explained a little better. Because it leaves you with the impression that he was unfairly kicked off his own land. And that's the premise of this movie, is that these people somehow owned all this land. And that is not how sharecropping works, unfortunately. And just real quick, the way it works is there's an owner of the land, and maybe he doesn't know how to farm, so he gets uh, one of these families, these sharecroppers, to live there, farm the land, and in exchange they get free rent. So basically they're renters. They, they never owned any of this land, and it's no different than any of you out there who rent. 
a landlord can give you 30 days notice and you have to leave and that's that's really the point the movie didn't clear up it left me the impression when I was a kid that some evil cabal had kicked them off their own land and that's what was going on in America and that's not really what happened Now, truth be told, this whole thing had to do with the invention of the tractor. And it's just the way it is. The age of the sharecropper with a plow being pulled by an oxen, those days were over. And it was just the reality of the time. And uh, one other thing, too, is that people often mistakenly conflate uh, the Dust Bowl days and what happened to sharecroppers with the, the Great Depression. Now, they were all at the same time, true, but it really all boils down to progress and the invention of the tractor. Now, with that said, uh, one wonders, well, what was going on with the Dust Bowl, and why did that happen? And the movie shows you the Dust Bowl going on, but it doesn't really explain why, which is interesting that they leave that out. And, you know, once again, you know, the farmers that were there were sharecroppers who uh, weren't very well educated. And what was going on is they were actually pulling up trees and things that uh, were needed to hold the soil in. I mean, they didn't know that that would cause environmental damage. And so now we had a gigantic dust bowl because of this. With that said, we're actually seeing history repeat itself again in the former Soviet Union with the Sea of Aral. Now, the farmers there really don't know what they're doing, and they decided they wanted to be cotton farmers, and cotton needs lots of water, and they've been uh, misdirecting water from that sea for decades now to the point where it's nearly dried up and has become one of the biggest environmental disasters in history, and I don't even know how you could reverse it or fix it at this point. Now, the Jode family is uh, reunited here, and they have a plan. They've all gotten these handbills that say uh, wanted 800 pickers in California to pick fruits and oranges and whatnot. And so their big hope in their life now is to get, load up their junky jalopy truck of theirs and head out to California and become pickers. And so that's the hope that the whole family and many of the families in this area of the country had at the time was to follow this dream to California and hopefully they will survive okay. Now I really don't want to spoil the whole story in case you're not familiar with it. Um, this is a really awesome movie despite uh, everything I said earlier. It's, uh, it's You still are caught up and swept up in the plight of the Jode family. That What they go through is just horrible. The movie version of it's bad enough. The book is actually worse. From what I understand, uh, John Steinbeck didn't hold back. Some of the things in the book you couldn't even put in the movie, as best I'll tell you right now. So one thing, though, I did, did want to talk about was the sequence where the Jode family had no choice. They had to pull up to a uh, migrant camp, encampment, where other families like them all settled into, and it's pretty rough. Uh, they're all starving, they're all just broken down and gotten really no hope, and it seems to be where the Jodes have ended up too. And there's a very sad sequence here with some children who live there that come to them assuming that they must have some food, and they're standing around with uh, looking very emaciated. And uh, the Jodes, you know, they didn't know what to do, so they, after they had their meal, they left the kids what they had left and uh, it's, it's such a heartbreaking sequence in the movie. Now as we wrap this up I did want to point out that I have this theory that Clint Eastwood actually saw this movie at some point early in his career and both of them are very tall lanky kind of actors and I noticed similarities between Henry Fonda's mannerisms and later on what would become Clint Eastwood's mannerisms in this movie. Uh, a lot of it's very subtle and it's hard to pick up on, but I noticed it and I thought that was interesting to point out. I highly uh, recommend you see this movie at least once. It's certainly a good popcorn cruncher and if you got nothing else to watch, uh, it's very enjoyable, a very adventurous kind of movie. Uh, I'm often drawn to these kind of stories about people struggling in poverty and just chasing dreams that never come true um, and 
and tragic figures. I'm often drawn to these kind of movies, and this is a wonderful example of it. Um, I've seen it a million times. I watch it every time it comes on, and it's really a wonderful movie, and I highly recommend it. Thank you.